Good afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome to St. Paul's Cathedral here to the Wren Suite for the latest of our Sunday forums. And uh, the forum happens once a month. And this particular forum also forms, because of the nature of, of what we're going to be uh, listening to and talking about, forms part of a series of events this month at St. Paul's, uh, marking the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And we have got a leaflet about it somewhere, but we're, we're, I've sent somebody off to try and find some for you. Not least this afternoon at Evensong at 3.15, we start um, a series of five Evensongs, and we're calling it the Reformation in Five Evensongs, music and talks uh, about music during the Reformation. But today our speaker is the writer, journalist, and broadcaster Peter Stanford, a former editor of the Catholic Herald. Peter writes features for the Daily and Sunday Telegraph and is a columnist in the Tablet and Third Sector magazines. He's presented television and radio documentaries, including the award-winning Channel 4 series, Catholics and Sex. It's even more exciting than the Reformation in five <laughs> even songs. <laughs> <laughs> BBC One's The She Pope and Channel 5's The Mission. He was one of the BBC commentary team for the papal visit to Britain in 2010, and his biography of Lord Longford was the basis for Channel 4's 2006 multi award winning drama Longford. Peter's books include Judas, The Troubling History of the Renegade Apostle, in which he argues, uh, uh, and the book he's come to talk to us about today, uh, Martin Luther. Catholic Dissident, and that book will be on sale uh, at the end of this session, so you'll be able to buy it. We, we don't know whether the hardback or the paperback is going to arrive, but it has just come out in paperback, so we'll see what our shop comes up with. Uh, we're delighted that Peter is here. He's going to talk to us about his book and the subject of his book for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes or so uh, to ask questions and then we'll wind up at the end and you can come over and talk to Peter and have a look at the book if you'd like to. So please would you give a very warm welcome to Peter Stanford. Hello, thank you all for coming. I felt very rude sitting outside as you were coming in. It was like it was a kind of wedding and it was a, a <laughs> greeting line. I felt I should apologise to you all as you arrive uh, in advance in case it all goes wrong. I really do need to apologise for, um, for Catholics and sex. As you can see, I can't quite say the word sex very easily. So when we made our Channel 4 television series, everyone said I was so hung up and, um, and Catholic about it, I couldn't even say the word properly, <laughs> which is probably true, I don't know. But anyway, I'm older and wiser now. Um, uh, so, Martin Luther, so it's going to be Martin Luther in 40 minutes as opposed to the Reformation in five even songs. <laughs> but um, I think perhaps I should start with, a, with a, quick, a quick note in case anyone's come under false pretenses. We're talking about Martin Luther, uh, not Martin Luther King. Now, I know you all know that, um, but I hope no one's here from the BBC. But um, uh, when, we were, when the book came out uh, at Easter, uh, the very nice uh, publicist at Hodder was speaking to a Radio 4 producer for a programme that better remain nameless. And she was saying how interesting Luther was as a subject and how uh, I really ought to go and talk about it. And the producer said, yeah, yeah, I'm, re I'm really liking all this bit in Germany, but just explain to me, how did he then get to the southern states of America? <laughs> <laughs> and we're worrying about tumbling standards now. But anyway, um, uh, and I, but I think actually it's true. I mean, it, it often clearly is not an infallible test to uh, Google things, but it is it's how we do everything now. If you Google Martin Luther, uh, you, you do inevitably get a couple of Martin Luthers at the top, and then you get an awful lot of Martin Luther Kings, who I think his appeal is kind of more obvious, really, to a generation. You also get that television detective called Luther, um, uh, Idris Elba's television detective. And indeed, some people, <coughs> when I was giving a talk like this, came up at the end and bought the book and said, you know, we've named our dog Luther. And I said, oh, that's great. You know, what was it about him that inspired you? She said, no, 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 after the television detective. <laughs> so I felt it hadn't quite worked. But perhaps they'll change their mind now. The reason, incidentally, that Martin Luther King is called Martin, or was called Martin Luther King, was that his father was a Baptist minister and in 1934 went to a conference in Berlin um, about... Uh, about Martin Luther and was so impressed by what he heard that he went back to the United States and got his five-year-old son, who was then called Michael, and uh, said, you're now going to be called Martin Luther King. So that's, that, that happened that way. And I suppose uh, that is a lesson for us all in that um, if, uh, if the Reverend King could find Martin Luther so interesting, 
when someone spoke about him in 1934. Perhaps I can, I can do a little tiny bit of that. You don't all have to go and rename your children and grandchildren when you get home after <laughs> Martin Luther. But, um, but I do think it's a good story. Um, uh, and of course, in this year, this is the 500th anniversary um, of the, uh, the start of the Reformation. The 31st of October is the date that it, is da that it comes from. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to issue a second health warning now. It seems terrible to issue health warnings, but anyway, we live in a health and safety age. Um, Luther didn't nail anything anywhere on the 31st of October, which is people sort of say it's the 30th an 500th anniversary of him nailing the 95 theses to the door of uh, the Castle Church in Wittenberg. Um, what we know, uh, well, we, one of the great things about Luther, one of the great things in studying Luther is that um, uh, in the Weimar archive, almost everything that he ever wrote, said, perhaps even thought, who knows, is all collected, all the documents there, all his letters, um, these wonderful table talks, which were uh, accounts taken by um, uh, his sort of followers in his later life. So he and his wife basically opened the uh, Black Cloister as a, as a posh B&B &B, uh, later, and students would come, and part of the thrill was you sat around the table while the great man spoke, and these things were all written down. Nowhere but nowhere in those 121 volumes does Luther ever mention nailing anything anywhere. What he says is that on the 31st of October, he sent the 95 Theses to his local Archbishop Albrecht, who was a bit of a wet lettuce, and um, instead of dealing with it, sent the 95 Theses on to Rome, and off the whole thing took in, in that sense. So we'll, 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 get on to, uh, we'll get on to Albrecht and Rome in a minute. I think the reason the nailing story, if you, if you, if you chase down the nailing story, uh, the first time it's mentioned is about 20 or 30 years after Luther's death, when people are trying to, uh, his, his, his followers then were trying to, I was going to say cement, but there's another hard word, really. But they were trying to sort of build his reputation as if it needed building anymore. So they, they, they elaborated on this story. Um, and then in the 19th, 18th and 19th century, it's really in the 19th century you start seeing an awful lot of illustrations of him knocking things on doors. Um, that, uh, that was very much around kind of German nationalism and German, Germans kind of hammering the rest of Europe and in a sense being the strongest force. So Luther at that stage was, um, was recruited to German nationalism, which is odd if you think about it. Uh, because one of the consequences of Luther's Reformation was that the, 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 the myriad of states that made up Germany in the 16th century and were in theory ruled over by the Holy Roman Emperor were actually pushed apart rather than brought together. Luther was hardly a force for, for German nationalism in, in that way. Uh, the other thing that always amuses me about the idea that he nailed things, I mean, obviously there's all the evidence, but just think about it. I think one of the, the, the nicest things you can do with history is just think about it. Um, so 95 theses... Now one, uh, now, one of the difficulties you have with Luther is a lot of the words that are associated with him are quite, uh, 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 in, a, in a secular, sceptical age such as our own, when people aren't particularly theologically literate, get a bit confusing. And we'll come on to justification by faith alone later on, um, which obviously I could fill five evening songs talking about, but I'll try and explain it relatively briefly. But, um, but uh, th when you think thesis, you think, oh, yeah, you know, we've got children, we've got grandchildren, we're going to university, I know what a thesis is. It's a 10,000-word essay or more. And so you think, oh, 95, 10,000 word essays, that's quite a lot. Um, well, of course, what, what the 95 theses were were debating points. They, they were literally proposals for, for, for debate. That's what they were. And what, um, uh, so what Luther did was he wrote them down, but each was about two or three sentences. So I'm not very good at maths, but two or three times 95 is quite a lot of sentences, really. So when, when you have this image of him, and all those 19th century images have Luther standing there with a funny cap on, knocking the nail into the door, and he's got a little piece of paper. It's like the petitions you get on, on a church door saying, Father's sermons are a bit boring. Uh, please sign up underneath if you want, you know, want him to improve. We're not talking that. We're talking a piece of wallpaper. I mean, it was literally would have covered the entire the door of the Castle Church in, um, in Wittenberg. So it's impractical as well as everything else. So health warning to one side. But Luther's is a good story. Now, one of the, one of the, 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 the reasons I was so keen to write the book, apart from the anniversary, was um, I grew up in the Catholic Church. Obviously, they didn't let me <laughs> some... They're not so ecumenical now, they let people who aren't Catholic edit the Catholic Herald. But um, uh, in my Christian Brothers School in Birkenhead, um, Luther was dismissed very, very quickly when we were doing the Reformation. That's wrong, really. But that was all there was to say about him. He got it wrong. So we didn't really go into Luther. And I think one of the problems more generally in, 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 in Britain is we tend to think, when we think about the Reformation, that... Um, that we had our Reformation. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of in the air at the moment, isn't it? But anyway, uh, but we had our Reformation. And our Reformation was about Henry VIII and uh, Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn and all of those things. 
And you know, if we know anything, we do know when we pull the pound coin out of our pocket still uh, with the Queen's picture, it has the letters FD after her name because she was defender of the faith. And why was she defender of the faith? Uh, because in 1522, Henry VIII wrote a, a defense of the seven sacraments. Well, Thomas More wrote it for him, but Henry VIII wrote a defense of the seven sacraments because Luther wanted to reduce their number to two slash three. Um, and so therefore, Henry VIII didn't like Luther. So Luther's reformation could have nothing to do with Henry VIII. Of course, nonsense, because of course, what Luther did, and the, one of the key things about Luther, is he broke that stranglehold that Catholicism had over late medieval Europe. Not just over theological thought, not just over worship, not just over congregations, but over political power. It's very, very important when you think about Luther and think about the late medieval period to get away from those ideas that we have nowadays about church and state and some sort of separation, both formal separation and indeed separation in people's minds. They, they, you know, they wouldn't have understood the concept that church and state were separate things. I mean, think a very good example, think of the Crusades. So the Crusades going off to the Holy Land, and this was meant to be, in one sense, a kind of God-inspired thing to, to bring the holy places back in, in Jerusalem under Christian control. So it was a, a kind of theological, a religious imperative that drove it. But of course, it was also a political imperative that drove it. Uh, partly some of the men who led the, um, led the armies that went out, they wanted land, they wanted power, they wanted a power base. So the two things were completely interchangeable in late medieval Europe. And, and in, in that sense, Luther wasn't. So what Luther was doing by, by breaking this hold that the Catholic Church had over everything else, opened doors and opened the door to Henry VIII. So he is entirely uh, relevant in that sense. And I think if anyone here is Scottish, I'm looking around for a kilt and there isn't one, but if anyone is Scottish, um, that people tend to think that, um, that uh, the Scottish Reformation uh, was, all about, uh, was all about Calvin and Calvin had nothing to do with Luther. Um, Calvin and Luther corresponded. You can draw a very, 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 very clear line between Luther and his, his thoughts. Zwingli in, in Switzerland, who started off as a Catholic priest, became a follower of Luther and then broke with him over the real presence in the Eucharist, whether it was symbolic or not, and then Zwingli and Calvin and on. The line is there. So the Reformation, for all, all Reformed Christians in this country, the Reformation should be... Uh, should be um, uh, absolutely relevant to them, but there's a more pressing reason. Now, over in Germany, where Luther came from, uh, they're much more aware of the importance of Luther, perhaps because their, uh, their chancellor is the daughter of a Lutheran pastor, or perhaps because about 30% of the, uh, the population in Germany are evangelicals. I mean, one of the things to remember about Luther is that he never called himself a Lutheran. Um, he didn't like it. He wasn't into personality cults. It was left to, I'm afraid it was left to the popes of the period to promote their nephews slash children to be their successors as pope. Luther told all his children not to take up ministry afterwards. So that's rather admirable, I think, um, in some ways. And he never wanted to be called a Protestant either. It was his opponents at the Diet of Speyer in 1529 who called them protesters, protestants. He only ever called himself an evangelical. So German Lutherans today are called evangelicals. And um, to celebrate the 500th anniversary there, um, Playmobil, those of you who have children or grandchildren will know these Playmobil figures, put things together. They, um, they issued a, a, a little, little statuette of Luther holding his Bible and his pen and uh, released it. And in the weekend that they released it, in 24 hours, it sold something like 38,000 copies. They know that he's important. Um, they realise, and there's a huge celebration going on this year, particularly this month in, in Germany. So they know his importance. And I think the, the, the most important, I'm going to put him there so you can watch us, the most important contemporary thing, that the thing that, that I would say, the reason why I would say, before we get into his life story, but the reason I would say he's most important to us is in 1521, after the Diet of Worms, uh, Luther had been excommunicated by the Catholic Church, and there was a real threat. People wanted to, uh, wanted to seize him from the, the lands of, the, um, of those German princes who'd followed his Reformation and hand him over to the, those German princes who hadn't, who, are, in a sense, were the, the, um, the Pope's uh, followers. And what they wanted to do was burn him to death, really, in, in very, very simple senses. And uh, so Luther was spirited away by Elector, of, Elector Frederick the Wise of Saxony, who was his protector, to Wartburg Castle, um, where he spent 10 months. And what he spent those 10 months doing was translating the New Testament into German. Luther believed really, really powerfully that, you, that the word of God was all and that you had to read the word of God. You had to know what God said, particularly you had to know what Jesus said in the Gospels in order to be a Christian. 
Um, Michael Gove would say uh, that he told us not to listen to experts to work it out for ourselves. But that's effectively what he was saying. He said, don't, don't wait for uh, you know, the Pope or your Cardinal or your Bishop to tell you what the Gospels say. Read it for yourself. Not only read it for yourself, but think about it for yourself. So, of course, at the time, uh, the Catholic Church had gone to extraordinary lengths to make sure that the Bible was only available in Latin. There had been attempts, notably here in England, uh, to, to translate it into the vernacular, but every attempt to translate it into the vernacular was crushed. Um, some of the attempts to translate it into the vernacular weren't, weren't as good as they could be. Luther's Bible, I'm told by people who are proper German speakers, is, is German at its very best. And in fact, some of them would say that uh, w what Luther wrote um, sort of brought together the different strands of the German language and created the modern German language, the canon of the modern German language. 1521, he translates the New Testament, and in the 1530s, he translates the whole of the Old Testament as well. So he gave people the word of God. And he didn't just give them the word of God. What he said to them was, I want you to read this, I want you to think about what the church teaches, and I want you to work out whether what the church teaches is what Jesus said. And at its simplest, I've mentioned it already in the context of Henry VIII, did Jesus in the Gospels institute seven sacraments? He certainly instituted uh, baptism. He certainly talked about the Eucharist at the Last Supper. He may have talked about confession, that's the two stroke three. The other ones, the other ones are not there. It wasn't that Luther didn't want those things to happen, but he said that they were not sacraments in that sense, because they weren't. So the test for him was, was it there in scripture? That's what he said to people. So what he was asking people to do was to run things through their individual, through their mind, through their conscience, and make up their own mind. Now that was a revolutionary thought in 16th century Europe, uh, because religious ideas then were all about the collective. So, you know, you, you assembled as a congregation and you, you didn't take an individual view, you took the collective view that was handed down to you, you didn't explore and examine. And I'm afraid in my own church, it was only in the 20th century, the Catholic Church started encouraging Catholics to read um, the Bible. Pontifical Biblical Institute was set up in the uh, early 1900s. Uh, until then. And actually, frankly, still, in our, in our local Catholic church, there was a notice up a few weeks ago, um, and it said, um, for the next five Mondays, Father Michael will explain to you what St. Matthew's Gospel says. And you thought, well, I can read. You know, I, you know I, I can have a look at it myself. I mean, yes, it needs interpreting. Yes, you can discuss it. So that's what Luther did. And the, the, the key point in terms of that and us now is that is the starting point of those ideas of individual conscience, individual liberty, making up your own mind that go through, that feed in the 17th and 18th century the Enlightenment, they become ideas of rights and go through to the 19th, 20th, 21st century and we talk about human rights. That idea that all of us as individuals are free to make our own decisions and follow our own decisions. And you don't have to, you don't have to trust me on this, um, the most militant, one of our most militant atheists, Anthony Grayling, uh, who writes, you know, a philosopher, writes histories of the, of the Enlightenment, says the starting point in his latest book, the starting point for Enlightenment ideas is Luther translating the Bible into German and handing it over to people. So actually all the things that we take for granted now, a lot of those are rooted back in Luther. So he is relevant to us now. Let me just have a quick sip of water. I don't know why I said that, because you could see I was doing it, but anyway, <laughs> always good to explain. Um, I, I suppose it's worth just dwelling, be again, before we get on to Luther's life story, to in some senses why, why he, uh, other reasons why people tend to look away, rather, from Luther, or we tend to think, certainly in this country, um, that he isn't as, as, as relevant as he could be. Um, actually, it, it's said that there are more books written about Luther than anyone else in Christianity apart from Jesus. And certainly there is, there is a big Luther industry in that sense. It tends to fall into two, two parts, as far as I can see. Um, one is a very academic part, because of this extraordinary array of 121 volumes of his, of his everything that's kept in the Weimar archive. Uh, there, there's a bit of a tendency, quite rightly, um, to, to focus on individual bits of it. And so there are an awful lot of books about very particular things that, that, that Luther did. And I suppose the second, um, the second group of authors who write about him a lot are Lutherans. Um, in a sense of, 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 of holding up his reputation, examining his reputation. Those, those broader books that, 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 that take Luther to a wider audience, I think, are relatively few and far between. Another thing to bear in mind about the kind of comparative neglect of Luther, again, certainly in our own uh, societies, uh, the kind of, uh, sort of secular scepticism, really, of, 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 uh, of our world now, which is rather depressing, where, you know, I don't know about you, but lots of people constantly tell me, if you vaguely mention that you have any sort of religious faith, they'll tell you that um, all religion does is make people go to war. It's all about wars, it's all about division, 
And, you know, there are plenty of perfectly good answers to that. So, for instance, if you think of the Hundred Years' War, well, not the Hundred Years' War, but a Hundred Years' War that followed Luther's death, people will say, oh, well, you know, when he died, they spent a hundred years killing each other, and those hundred years were actually more destructive of the fabric of Germany, of lives in Germany, even than the Second World War. But they weren't, that wasn't a religious, well, it was a religious war in one sense, but some of the Protestant princes fought alongside Catholic princes in that. They fought against each other. It was about economics. It was about politics. It was about all the things that wars are also about, but religion gets the blame. So I think when you try and talk to people about Luther nowadays, they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, he was one of those people who sort of subdivided Christianity, wasn't he? But I think Christianity is fairly irrelevant, and they all had a war over it, so what do I care? And I hope what I just said to you about human rights and Luther's importance in the history of the development of who we are and who we think we are uh, uh, counters that. It's, it's, it's a very foolish reason to push him to one side. And um, I think people's memory of him from school teaching can be a bit dusty as well, um, and, and the way that he was treated. <coughs> um, and I think the other thing that doesn't do him any good at all is the, uh, these portraits of him. I mean, so Luther lived in um, Wittenberg. Uh, uh, he taught at the University of Wittenberg. And the court painter in Wittenberg, the court painter of Elector Frederick the Wise of Saxony, was um, Lucas Cranach the Elder, who he and his studio painted a whole series of Luther images. Very important, I'll come on to in, a, in another sense. Uh, but they po pointed this one. Now, what we know about Luther was he had this extraordinary effect over Europe. He had extraordinary effects over crowds. He could really, he kind of turned the argument in lots of ways. He must have been quite charismatic. You don't get it really on that, from that picture, do you? <laughs> he's looking, let's, let's be fair, he's looking a bit porky. He's looking a bit, um, he's looking a bit miserable. And, um, and, and, and it's just rather off-putting. I think the image of Luther is very off-putting. And again, uh, probably for worse rather than for better, we're a very image-conscious society. What a lot of people seem to remember about Luther from their school days, and perhaps they all went to Catholic schools like me where they only told bad things about him, was that A, he was obsessed by the devil, hence the ink pot that he threw against the wall in Wartburg Castle. He did that complete fabrication. Where there was a very, very good um, detailed account of some, um, some, some uh, custodians of that castle thinking they'd drum up a bit of business by putting an ink stain on the wall. So that isn't true at all. We love making stories, don't we? Um, and um, the other thing, I'm afraid, which is true about him is um, he does talk an awful lot about his constipation. And, um, and obviously we're English and we're very polite about these things. We don't like to talk about it very much. And he always blames his constipation on the devil. And although I've just said to you that Luther wrote very beautiful German in his translation of the, uh, of the New Testament, and indeed, those of you who know his hymns, The Mighty Fortress is My God, you know, he, he could express himself very powerfully and very movingly. He also could sound like a football manager at times uh, when, he, when he said things. And so quite a lot of his letters are all about the problem. I, actually, I can't even say what he said. I'm in St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, but he talked, he talked about his, his nether regions, shall we say, in a very English way, at great length. And that's what people remember at all. And I suppose the thing to remember is, well, lots of people are constipated, but the thing to remember about late medieval Europe is everyone was obsessed by the devil. It was part, you know, it doesn't make him unusual. So let's not be put off by that. And the final thing I'm going to say about things that put people off, and let's, I can't, I can't dismiss this one quite so lightly, is people say he was anti-Semitic, is the charge that is raised against Luther. And it's raised on, a, on, on, on the basis of one very particular document written in the late 1530s, where he said that um, Jews should be burnt out of their synagogues, which is anti-Semitic, there's no excuse for that, um, and no, no excusing that either. And, um, and one particular episode, which happened in the early 1930s, when I talked before about Luther being taken over by German nationalism in the 19th century, uh, the Nazis were very keen to, to justify the appalling things they did by claiming kind of antecedents in that sense. And they claimed Luther as their antecedent on the basis of this 1539 document. And they turned up en masse in the Black Cloister in Wittenberg, decked it out in Nazi flags, Goering, Goebbels, they were all there. And so Luther was, Luther was used to justify what they did in terms of his views on Jews. Um, all of that is true, so yes, he is anti-Semitic. Um, what I would say in terms of context, and I think one of the things about any history is you have to understand the context of it, everyone in the 16th century was anti-Semitic. Certainly everyone in 16th century Germany was anti-Semitic. There were very few towns in Germany where Jews were allowed to live in ghettos and do, um, do kind of money changing, which was the thing, not that they particularly wanted to do, but it was the only thing they were allowed to do by the kind of Christian authorities. Wittenberg was not one of those towns. Neither was Erfurt, where he was at university. It is exceedingly likely that Luther never met a Jew in his whole life, never knowingly met a Jew in his whole life. 
Um, so he shared the, the prejudices of the times. And, and I suppose if you're going to dismiss someone as interesting or as worthy of thought in the 21st century uh, because they express anti-Semitic um, views in the 16th century, then I'm afraid you dismiss all of them, full stop. Um, so you have to be careful of that. And the final thing I'll say about that is in um, 1521, one of the things that Luther believed very strongly was that the that, that kind of that clerical lay divide that you still get in some parts of Christianity, where the clergy regard themselves as a higher calling to the calling of the laity, uh, really had to go. That had no part in it. He was particularly interested in salvation, particularly interested in the way people got to heaven, and that the, the understanding at the time was if you became a monk or a priest, you'd get into heaven quicker than the rest of us. He didn't like that at all. He wanted that gone as that idea. So he was a great proponent of, um, of marriage. He, that, that's one of the reasons why he thought clergy should marry, why monks should marry, why nuns should marry. He didn't think they all had to marry, but he thought they should marry, that it should be something that's open to them. So in 1521, he wrote this very beautiful document about marriage and what a good idea it was. And in that document, he talks very strongly about why it would be a very, you know, we should marry who we want to marry. Um, so he was talking, I suppose, in some ways about saying, you know, if a priest wants to marry a nun, that is fine. But he also goes on and says there that it's very important, you know, if you want to marry a Jew, that's absolutely fine. That should be fine by the church. And even if you want to marry a Muslim, that should be fine in terms of the views of the church. Now, think of the context. We're talking about the Ottoman Turks are sweeping up to the gates of Belgrade, absolutely at the time of Luther, and very slightly later, the gates of Vienna. And so Luther was actually quite enlightened in, in these things. And I suppose, just, just to go off on a personal note, just to show how unenlightened we can be nowadays, uh, my parents, my father wasn't Catholic, my mother was, uh, they got married in 1946 in Liverpool, uh, where the, uh, the priest told my mother she should be ashamed of herself. My father refused to become a Catholic, um, and um, they were made to marry on a Wednesday afternoon in a side chapel with the lights turned out. <laughs> So there's Luther getting ahead of things, getting ahead of things. Actually, there's a very funny postscript to that story. This isn't part of the story. So my mother died before my father. My father always came to church with us, never became a Catholic. And, um, and he lived for uh, six years longer than my mother and always went to the Catholic church afterwards. They all used to visit him. They were all great. They all thought he was part of the parish. And when he was dying, the parish priest went to visit him in the, lo in the local hospital. And, um, and was went and said, you know, so Mr. Stanford, you know, you've always been part of the parish. You know, you know Catholicism better than anyone. If you'd like to, to join the church, I can just do it quickly and easily now. Um, my father being my father looked at him and said, mm, I think I need a bit more time to think about it. <laughs> and he died two hours later. <laughs> and he had a wonderful Catholic funeral. So that's the, we're much better at these things nowadays, aren't we? So they are, I think, the reasons why, um, why, uh, why Luther, in some ways, is, um, is overlooked. The other thing to say about him, just again, to frame the, the kind of the, the story, which I'll tell you in a moment, is it's the sheer achievement and the sheer courage that he had that really, um, that really struck me about his story. Um, so Luther was, um, was an Augustinian friar. He wasn't a monk. Very important to get your terminology right. He was never a monk. He was an Augustinian friar. And fri Augustinian friars live in cloisters. And so he didn't go into the monastery. He went into a cloister. And, um, but the cloister that he chose, uh, first of all in Erfurt and then in Wittenberg, was not one of the great houses of Europe. It wasn't one of the, the great centres. And the university that he taught at, Wittenberg University, uh, was set up only about three or four years beforehand by a lecture of Frederick the Wise. Wasn't one of the great universities, wasn't Oxford, wasn't Bologna, wasn't the Sorbonne, wasn't Louvain, wasn't any of those places. And in terms of Catholic politics at the time, Germany was very much regarded as a backwater. Um, I'm not going to draw parallels with the European Union, even though it's so tempting to think about it. But, um, but basically what the, what the Pope in Rome thought was Germany was good for the money. So you made Germans send you money, and, um, and then you ignored what they thought. And that made lots of Germans very angry, and that's part of his story we'll come to in a second. Um, but so, we have this obscure friar from an obscure, uh, obscure sort of province of his order, teaching in an obscure university, teaching in a backwater of Germany that everyone, uh, Germany that, that, that in Roman Catholic terms, in Renaissance Rome as it's rebuilding St. Peter's, is regarded as a real backwater. And he is the man who, within four years between um, issuing the 95 Theses in 1517 and the Diet of Worms in 1521 and being excommunicated in 1521, had the whole of Europe talking about him. Isn't that extraordinary? We live in an age of mass communications, but he managed to do it then. And he did it by force of his personality, by force of his arguments, and by, by, by force of his sheer courage. Um, 
the Diet of Worms, uh, so he's called to the Diet of Worms to explain himself before uh, not only all the assembled... So Diet of Worms is al always gets very confusing, doesn't it, when you're English? So diets are gatherings of all the, of the representatives of the constituent parts of the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, uh, Empire, and um, Worms is the town, Worms, um, I, I suppose I should say. So it wasn't that he went to eat worms, he went to a town called Worms in order to, to speak for... So he spoke before the assembled group, which was um, uh, the, uh, the Emperor, Charles V was there, all the leaders, all these people were there, and they gave him the opportunity there. He knew what they wanted to do. They wanted to silence him in the most brutal way. He knew what they wanted to do. Um, about 70 years beforehand, there'd been a reformer who he, he, he followed in many ways called Jan Hus, a bohemian, um, who was called to the Council of Clarence. And what the Catholic Church then said, you know, we just want to explore your ideas, Jan. Just come and have a chat with us. It'll be absolutely fine. We guarantee you self safe passage. And he got there, and they burnt him at the stake when he got there. So Luther knew what he was facing, and still he went. Still he went. There were opportunities on his way there to duck out of going. Still he went. Extraordinary courage. Stands up in front of them all, and they say, you know, uh, these books you've written, if you disown the books, you know, you might have a chance. And I just think, think to yourself, what would you do in that situation? When I was writing about it, but what would I do in that situation? And I think what I would do is say, could we just go into a room and have a little chat about this and find a form of words that would satisfy everybody? And what does Luther do? He goes away and thinks about it and comes back the next day and comes out with this phrase, which is one of the phrases most associated with him, and it's one that isn't difficult to understand. Here I stand, I can do no other. Isn't that extraordinary? Here we, we live, here we are in the 21st century. God, for one person who would stand up amongst our leaders and say, here I stand, I can do no other, would be pretty good, wouldn't it? And there's Luther doing it. I think that sheer courage is something that makes him an extraordinary figure 500 years on. So let's talk very quickly. or well, not too quickly. I talk quickly. Sorry, if I'm talking too quickly, um, put your hand up and say, slow down. Um, I'm really <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so Luther was born in 1483. Um, he later said, he always claimed to be um, the son of poor parents. Um, I'm afraid he wasn't uh, above telling slight lies as well. His parents weren't particularly poor. Um, he tells this story about his mother. His father was a poor miner, and his mother used to collect wood in the forest to, uh, to uh, burn on the fire. Um, not true. Uh, his father owned the mining rights to various mines. <laughs> so we're talking British coal, not Arthur Scargill. And, um, <laughs> Glad to know people still remember those names. And, um, and uh, his, mother, his mother actually came from the kind of mercantile class, the rising burger class that was, that was, that was coming up in the towns then. And what they did do with their money is they, sent him, they gave them an education. Um, uh, at that stage, you, know, you were lucky if you got an education at all. You, certainly your education would stop at 12 if you were a boy, and you would go off and do other things. They gave him a, a, an education all the way through. And his father's great ambition was that Luther would become a, a lawyer and become a court official. Um, rather like, I suppose, Thomas Cromwell under Henry VIII. Um, but that, that's, really, that's really what he had in mind. And uh, Luther goes along with that um, uh, and goes along to Erfurt University, does really well in his exams. Um, but what he tells us in his writings is all the time he was there doing his, um, doing his law things, he has this kind of sense that he'd go into a library and the Bible would be open there, and he was drawn. He says he was drawn all the time to kind of reading it, but he didn't have time. So he starts doing some sort of postgraduate qualification um, in 50... Sorry, I'm, I'm just rounding up what these things are, just in terms that we understand, in 1505. And he goes home to see his parents. Um, and uh, by this stage, clearly, he is, uh, he's quite keen to change courses. And, um, and then on the way home, famously, there is a thunderstorm. And he's in open countryside, and he says that he was so scared of being killed by a thunderbolt um, that he, offered, uh, he, off he made an offer to St. Anne, the mother of the Virgin Mary, that if he survived the thunderstorm, he would go into a monastery. Um, now, this is the story that he told, and one of the things famous people do in their lives is they often come up with a kind of reason why they did things, because there has to be a reason why we do everything, doesn't there? I think probably not, but I think in that case, he thought there had to be one. Um, the odd detail in that is St. Anne. Why didn't he say it to the Virgin Mary? What we know about St. Anne was she was a patron saint of minors. We also know um, that his father was quite devoted to, to, um, uh, to St. Anne. And obviously I explore this in greater length in the book, but it seems to me what he was doing there was trying to find a way to make, him to make his dad let him give up law and go to theology. So who better to appeal to than his father? Because, you know, if you go home and say, Dad, I'm really bored by your choice you're making me do at university, I'm going to have to go somewhere else. Um, Dad might not listen very well, but if you say, Dad, 
God, through St. Anne, has spoken to me and told me I should go into a monastery. It's pretty hard for your God-fearing dad to say no, really, isn't it, in that sense? So uh, th th I think that story is, 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 is a rounded story in some ways. But what Luther then does is two weeks later, he goes into the Augustinian monastery um, in Erfurt. And what we know about his time in the monastery, and I think it predates that, is Luther had a really, really strong sense of God being distant, of, of, of not only just distant and deaf to him, but kind of angry with him as well. And he, he, he struggled with this in the monastery. So he, once he gets into the monastery, he becomes the model monk. So, you know, he's always hoeing the carrots in the garden. He's always following the monastic hours. He's the one who, at 2 o'clock in the morning, when they get up to do whatever it is they do at 2 o'clock in the morning, he's the first one up, knocking on everyone's doors, saying, time to go back to the chapel. He sings loudest. He loves music. Um, he goes... The thing that he does do as well, we know, he's constantly going to confession. So much so, his, conf his confessors start complaining about him because he goes and sits there for about eight hours running <laughs> through all his sins and how bad he's been. And no confessionals then. It was face-to-face. -face. And... Um, and then he'd get up at the end, evidently, and they think, phew, he's gone. And then he'd go towards the door, and he'd turn back and say, I've just thought of one more thing, and sit down again. <laughs> so he was a man who, I mean, it's funny, but he was a man who was tortured, tortured by this sense that God was not only absent, but silent in his life. And he has a word that he uses for it, anfektung. Um, it's a word that doesn't really translate very well into English, but it has a real sense in it of depression, of, 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 of torture, but of a really physical side to this, that he was really physically tortured. And I think, you know, looking back at it, and you have to be very careful with 21st century eyes of looking back and thinking people were going through some sort of mental illness. But, there's, you know, there's, there's something very, very powerful about what he's going through then. And what his confessor suggests he does, well, he suggests all sorts of things, like he suggests he goes to Rome, and he goes to Rome, and he hates Renaissance Rome. He thinks it's the most corrupt place he's ever been to. But he also suggests that he starts reading the Gospels and the, letter, the letters of St. Paul. So he starts reading St. Paul, starts lecturing at v Wittenberg University on the letters of St. Paul, and he comes across this phrase in St. Paul's uh, letter to the Romans, where St. Paul talks about um, God's justice. Now, what, when the, this, this, this phrase, justification by faith alone, which again feels very sort of distant, I think, to us all in the 21st century, it is actually about something very, that I think probably concerns all of us. What Luther was interested in was ideas of salvation. And what, what Luther, like many people in late medieval Europe, where life really did hang by much more of a thread than it hangs by, uh, in our own, you know, famines, plagues, black death, marauding <coughs> armies, the, the sheer tenuousness of life, they were obsessed by how you won your place in heaven, how God would judge you well, how God, why God would show you mercy and love and forgiveness at the end of your life. And so in this, this phrase of St. Paul's about the just, the just shall live by faith, Luther found what he thought was the answer. So what the Catholic Church taught at the time was if you wanted to get to heaven, you had to go to Mass all the time, uh, you had to go to the sacraments, and you had to do good works. Good works, the, the phrase that is associated against him. And the good works could range from taking, you know, taking uh, part in a procession, um, uh, marking religious uh, festivities, giving money to the church, or in particular, um, uh, the good works was going, going, going to look at relics and going and worshipping before relics, big cult of relics in, 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 in many, indeed in Wittenberg as well, in the Castle Church there, they had all of this. And the, the other thing that they did in all of this was they sold indulgences. So what they were doing was they were selling pieces of parchment that effectively said, because you've given the church money, the church forgives the sins you've committed up to date. So when you turn up at St. Peter's Gates, you can say, the sins that I did before are forgiven. So in a way, if you're worried about death and you're worried about salvation, you are, it's like taking out an insurance policy. And the church went one stage further. It said not only could you take out an insurance policy for yourself by buying an indulgence, you could take one out for your dead relatives. So what people in late medieval Europe believed very strongly was you're quite likely to go to hell, but the the, really the best you could hope for was to go to purgatory and you'd be waiting in purgatory. So the idea of the salesman of indulgences, these travelling preachers, was that you went round and uh, you could buy indulgences for your dead relatives, and so, you know, get them upgraded, in that sense, to heaven. And, of course, think what Luther was saying, that it was by faith. For St. Paul talks about the just shall live by faith. Luther thought that, you, that your, your way into heaven was simply to do with your faith, that it was God's judgment, it was God's mercy, and we can't... Um, we can't uh, prejudge that. We can't second guess that. You absolutely can't sell it like a commodity beforehand. 
and that it remained fundamentally a mystery. It wasn't that he thought good works were a bad thing. He didn't want us all to go around and poke each other's eyes out. But what he wanted us to do was to concentrate on our relationship with God, to understand that God couldn't be sort of um, deconstructed into a series of boxes you could tick. God's, God's love, God's mercy was a mystery. And also he then focuses the ideas on God's love in sending his son to earth. God's love and God's mercy in sending Jesus, Jesus and the crucifixion. These are the things that Luther is focusing on. And they are the antithesis of what the Catholic Church is talking about. And then what happens in 1517, because Pope Leo X um, has run out of money with his rather elaborate plans to build St. Peter's, which of course we can all see nowadays, um, he, um, he commissions another indulgence, sale of indulgences around Germany by a Dominican preacher called Tetzel. And Tetzel turns up in a town called Jutterburg, uh, which is quite close to Wittenberg. And all Luther's parishioners, he, he, he's a great preacher, but believed absolutely powerfully the word of God and the word, uh, explaining the word of God from the pulpit. All his parishioners disappeared off from the church to go and buy indulgences from Tetzel and Jutterburg. And Luther was furious. And that's why he wrote the 95 Theses. The 95 Theses, initially, are all about the sale of indulgences. And it's not that he doesn't like the selling, which he doesn't, but much more importantly, it's about, it's about how we earn salvation. And he says the Catholic Church is going about it all in the wrong way. And, of course, part of the argument is that what the Catholic Church is doing in that situation is that it is allowing the Pope to take on the role of God, to to, for the Pope to decide what happens in heaven. And that is God's role. And so, of course, what he was then doing was challenging papal authority. So the 95 Theses start with a very... Ooh, that might be the Pope coming in. Um, <laughs> that the, um, the 95 Theses start with a very simple proposition, which I think, you know, it seems perfectly reasonable. You can't do these things. But it very quickly moves on in the 95 Theses to the question of papal authority. And that is what the battle is over from 1517 to 1521. It's about papal authority. And there's a very good quote here from Luther, which I'm just going to read you very quickly. These are from one of these table talks he gave at the end of his life, and he was being asked about what, what got him started on all this. Tetzel started preaching the sale of his indulgences in Jutterburg, and all the people ran to him as though they were possessed. Little by little, I began to persuade people otherwise, and to explain to them what grace and forgiveness of sins meant. But then, when Tetzel still went shamelessly forward, I published the theses concerning indulgences. They started a storm in the entire world, and I love this line. At that time, I still regarded the Pope as my Lord. I thought I'd done him a favour. <laughs> so, this is what he does. So, going back to that image I said before, obscure friar, obscure university, backwoods of Germany, how, how did it suddenly take off? Some very, very important things about this. Um, uh, about 40, 50, 60 years before uh, Luther, Gutenberg had invo invented the printing presses in Germany. So by Luther's time, every German town, including Wittenberg, would have a printer who was kind of printing things out and handing them round. Um, that's good as far as it goes, but only 5% of people were literate. Um, so what Luther did when he sent, not nailed, when he sent the 95 Theses to his archbishop, knowing the archbishop was a bit of a, a wet lettuce, is he thought he, would, he wouldn't take it seriously. So what Luther did was he gave the text of the 95 Theses in German to the printer and then boiled them down into kind of edited highlights almost, which the printer then printed. But the final bit of genius in all of this was that um, uh, Lucas Cranach, the Elder Studio, which I talked about beforehand, they did some very simple woodcut illustrations. So if you couldn't, uh, so the 5% the who are literate could read them to the 95% who weren't and then show them the pictures and they could understand what he was getting on, getting on at. And that became what I think we would say now, it went viral. So the printer passed it on to printer, passed it on to printer from town to town to town. And what we know is that within a month, within one month, of the 31st of October. These texts were circulating not all over Germany, but in France, in Switzerland, in England, and in Rome. People were reading them in Rome. So it went viral across Europe by using the social media platform in, in, in our own terms. And why did it go viral? Well, it went viral for a, a, a combination of reasons. First of all, Luther was tapping into a theological debate that existed already. Uh, Erasmus, uh, you know, people in the great universities. You know, Erasmus had written all these witty satires about the Pope and how corrupt the papacy was, and how it needed to change, and how we needed, we, 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 you know, it, 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 it couldn't carry on uh, in such a corrupt way. So he was absolutely tapping into a rich vein in that sense, and many theologians agreed with him. Um, but he was also tapping into uh, the discontent of the poor in Germany. They felt they were just being exploited. The church was taking money from them to siphon off to Rome. So all that thing about I'm a poor man, exploiting the poor. And the third group of
the people he was um, exploiting with the German princes or uh, uh, linking in with the German princes. They were tired of being told what to do by the Holy Roman Emperor. They wanted more independence and they wanted to break that stranglehold of the Catholic Church. So they, they were very keen on that. So he found a ready audience and it was that audience that lined up behind him. It was that audience that lined up behind him uh, when he was excommunicated and... Um, and I'm, I'm going, gosh, I've seen what the time is. Uh, it was that, that was the audience that he spoke to. Final very, I hope we might explore a few of these in a minute, but let me just make a final very, very important point about uh, Luther. The book is called Martin Luther, Catholic Dissident. Obviously, Luther was born a Catholic, raised a Catholic, prepared as a Catholic. All his reactions were against Catholicism in that way. Did Luther plan to start a reformation? No. He tried to heal his own anfectung. He tried to hear God's voice, and then he felt that he was hearing God's voice. What he does when he comes out of Wartburg Castle in 1522 is he goes back to Wittenberg, and what does he set up? He sets up what he sees as a church within a church, a parallel organisation, a model of reformed church with married clergy, mass in the vernacular, just three sacraments, a great sense of social commitment. I mean, none of, it to, none of it to object to. So he sets up this model, and what he then goes forward and does is he, tr he, he, he tries to negotiate with Rome. Don't let anyone tell you he didn't try to negotiate or he wouldn't compromise. 1530, Diet of Augsburg, uh, the Protestant side, uh, the, the Lutheran side, send their, their confessions of Augsburg, which is their negotiating position. So it's a bit like David Davis going off with his... No, he hasn't got a negotiating position, has he? Sorry, silly me. Uh, going off with their negotiating position. And he goes, and do you know what they take out, what isn't there in the, in the, um, in the Augsburg confession? Papal authority. He turns, takes out, A, he takes out the most contentious issue because he wants to reach an accommodation, and B, he doesn't go himself because he knows that he just inflames passions. So he tries to, do, to, 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 to bring that accommodation forward. Admittedly, he tries and he wants everyone else to go 90% and, 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 and he'll only go 10%, there's David Davis, um, that, he wa that he wants to do that, um, but he does try. So 1521, Luther was excommunicated by the Catholic Church, so I can't call him a Catholic, can I? Yes, I can. What the Catholic Church teaches when it excommunicates people is that it is a medicinal recipe. It's still what they call it, medicinal re remedy, sorry, remedy. Um, yes, you could take it. Anyway, it, it, it's, um, it, it's a medicinal remedy, and the idea is that it's meant to bring you to your senses. You're meant to kind of renegotiate your way back into the church. And I would argue, and indeed do argue in the book, that from 1521 through to his death in 1546, Luther was trying to negotiate his way back. To, to some accommodation with the Catholic Church. What is absolutely, absolutely clear is Luther died believing himself still to be a Catholic. And I, I, the, the final point that I'll make just in all of this is that um, here we are in 2017, uh, the 500th anniversary. We're not doing much in this country, but in Europe, the anniversary is being very widely celebrated. Who's organising it? The World Lutheran Federation, obviously, and the Vatican. They're organising it together. They published a joint declaration in 1999 to say they agreed on everything now. There's no fundamental theological difference between us. So yes, religion causes divisions. Yes, it caused hateful divisions in Germany uh, alongside other things. But here we are, 500 years on, and I agree, 500 years is a very, very, very long time to make friends. But here we are, 500 years on, and we're actually understanding what we all share in common. So much so that when I went into a Lutheran church in Wittenberg and went to the service, I didn't know I wasn't in a Catholic church. The only thing that gave it away was that the Reverend, um, oh, what was Wilf, he was called Wilf, who was at the front, was that Mrs. Wilf was sitting in the front row, and she led us a cappella in um, a Mighty Fortress is My God, which of course is in Catholic hymnals now. But obviously we just need our priests to be married, and we need some women priests as well. But apart from that, the Catholic church is getting there. So there's history full circle, and that's me stopping talking. Thank you very much. Peter, thank you so much, and thank you for your energy, which I think has really inspired us. So uh, we've got some time now for questions. Could you, if you do have a question, uh, could you ask it as concisely as you possibly can? Yeah, don't follow my lead. So that, I, so that I can repeat it for the benefit of the video. Yeah, but if you do a long one, I won't, I'll lose the, the gist of it. So hands up if you have a question for Peter. Yes. 
w w uh, Beckett was murdered. Are we surprised that Luther wasn't murdered? Um, well, they would have murdered him if they could. Um, and as I mentioned, Jan Hus beforehand. The other thing to say about Luther, of course, is nothing that he said theologically was new. It, was, it had all been said by people beforehand. So they would have murdered him if they could. They would have put him to death as a heretic if they could. The reason they couldn't in Worms, when he said, here I stand, I can do no other, is there was a huge crowd of people outside who agreed with him. So they knew that if they, if, they, uh, if, they, if they took him off to wherever they were going to take him, that they would prompt a popular revolt. It actually happens in 1525, and Luther sides against the poor there, which is quite uh, interesting, and we could, we, could, we could spend another even song talking about that. But, um, but, but he had a huge popular... It's really important, when you look at this miserable old picture of him, to remember he was amazingly popular. He was the sort of Desmond Tutu kind of figure, not the Antoine Suchi. And actually, look at this, look at this one. He's, um, he's smiling on it. They've realised he's smiling, and he's got a little kiss curl at the front, which makes him look a bit, a bit better. So he, he got away with it because, because the public... The public supported him. Yes. Um, you say that Luther died still wanting to be a Catholic. They believe in the start of evil. Where did he then part company from Calvin? Did Calvin see himself at that time? No. So did, did, um, where, where is Luther different from Calvin in terms of believing that he died a Catholic? Well, what I, I said at the beginning, I uh, talked about the, the reason Luther is um, important for all of us, these ideas about liberty and conscience and reading the Gospels and making your own mind up and making decisions. And that's all well and good, and that works really well in lots of ways. The problem with that, the structural problem, is that if we're going to be in a church, there has to be something that holds us together in a structure. So what Luther really felt was that we should, you should all read the, uh, the Gospels and you should all agree with him. Um, was, was, the, was the problem. So then along comes Vingley, first of all, who says, well, I more or less agree with you, Mike, uh, Martin, and, uh, but I've got, I've got this bit about the Eucharist, where the Lutheran position on the Eucharist is pretty close to transubstantiation. It's certainly the real presence. Um, and Calvin, um, sorry, and Zwingli says it's, it's just symbolic, it's just a kind of symbol. And they have a terrible falling out and they have a bit of a battle, a, 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 you know, fisticuffs in, in um, not Luther, but Swiss people um, at that time. And then Calvin comes along afterwards and Calvin believes um, is absolutely on the symbolic side of it all. And, 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 you know, what, and, and what, uh, one of the things that's striking about going into a Lutheran church is I think I slightly expected it would all be very kind of plain and white and miserable, really. And Lutheran churches are, are, are very recognisable to any of us who are used to Catholic churches or uh, most Anglican churches, full of song, full of music, full of decorations. Uh, Calvin took it to, to much, much greater extremes and, and on to the question of predestination. So, no, Calvin absolutely rejected, uh, uh, and, and indeed Zwingli, uh, uh, Zwingli very publicly uh, before he died, says, I am no longer a Catholic, I have no part. Luther never says that anywhere. No, nowhere but nowhere, in those 121 volumes, will you hear Luther saying, I'm not a Catholic anymore. He just wanted the church to join him. Yes? Um, in what way did Luther's teaching on salvation um, and purgatory influence the doctrine of purgatory during that English Reformation? How does Luther's <laughs> teaching on purgatory affect the English interpretation of it in, in the English Reformation? Well, obviously, the idea of purgatory came, came before Luther, um, and purgatory had been around from about... <laughs> Well, again, the Catholic Church will tell you purgatory's been around since God created it, but um, uh, 12th century, let, let, sorry, sorry to disappoint you. Um, uh, that, that, that's where you start, here, 11th, 12th century, you start hearing people uh, talk about it, um, which is all part of that kind of rather gloomy medieval idea that no one can get to heaven. Um, there's, there's a lot of interaction between uh, Luther and um, kind of English rebels over that whole period. I mean, the kind of, the, the Lollards, the Lollards nail things to doors. A lot of the Lollard propositions are around mass, uh, services in the vernacular. So those, uh, there's an overlap in those ideas, um, uh, particularly the idea of the, of, the, of the Bible in the vernacular, people being able to understand things. So there is, a, 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 there is, um, uh, there is absolutely a kind of overlap. Luther, oddly, um, in a very funny way, Luther do, isn't really very interested in purgatory. You'll find very, very little on hell or purgatory in Luther's writing, which, as I've said already, he was devil-obsessed. He was very obsessed by the devil, but he was much more, and I, sh I actually think it's much more positive, he was much more concerned about how you got into heaven. 
what, what, that, what, that, what that process was about, what God's mercy was about, what God's forgiveness was about. I mean, you know, Pope Francis, God's forgiveness, that's what mercy and forgiveness, that's what he talks about all the time. So he was much more interested in those. So I don't think, I think you're right to highlight a, a link between them and that there's certainly an overlap there, but I think Luther's ideas around purgatory are, were, 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 were slight enough not to have any particular influence going forward. I think he's, he was much more... I mean, I suppose it could be an indirect influence in the sense that um, he was talking about salvation and how you achieve salvation. And if you talk about how you're going to achieve salvation, necessarily you'll understand how people can't achieve salvation. I think he saw uh, purgatory as another place where people were kind of ripped off by the sale of indulgences more than anything else, which I don't think was particularly the English view. But I think you know better than I do. I'm going to be careful as I say. <laughs> yes. What is uh, what is Luther's status in the Roman Catholic Church today? Um, Pope Benedict, of course, the German, went back um, in uh, about 2011, 2012, uh, to Erfurt, where Luther had first been at university, and said he was a wise teacher and an inspired man, which was better than Pope Leo X, who said he was. Um, did he say he was a loathsome little monk or a pathetic <laughs> little monk? He certainly said he was drunk. Um, uh, and Luther did like, quite like a drink. But anyway, I'm sure Pope Leo liked drinks as well. Um, uh, uh, so he was, he, was, he was, you know, insofar as Benedict was more, I hate these words, but more conservative in, in, a, in a very broad understanding of it um, than, than, than many Catholics. Uh, he was, was signalling his approval there. He went to, you know, where Luther had actually s uh, studied. And then Pope Francis, uh, so that the, the 500th anniversary celebrations inevitably have been going on since the 499th year. So they started last October, big gathering of Lutheran, uh, Lutheran bishops, Luther, Lutherans have bishops, um, in, um, in uh, Lund, I think, in Sweden, is that right? Lund is in Sweden, isn't it? And Pope Francis went along to that and got lots of jit from all those miserable old traditionalists in the Vatican who keep sending him notes saying he's wrong. It doesn't make me laugh. Don't you, don't you love the idea? So, when we had Pope John Paul II and we had Pope Benedict, um, all the, the very conservative Catholics would say to, to people like me, you know, the Pope has pronounced on this. So, you, you know, you have to follow what the Pope says, women priests in particular. And then when you argued, they'd say, you know, you shouldn't call yourself a Catholic. So now, here's the Pope pronouncing on things. They're also saying, he shouldn't go and visit Lutherans. <laughs> and you say, ah, oh, but you, you told me, you, if the Pope says it, it's all right. So, it, um, it's, uh, uh, he, so he has been, and he was really, really interestingly, he then um, went to the Lutheran church in Rome uh, later, and a couple were sitting there, and he did a Q&A afterwards, probably did a lot better than I'm doing it now, but he did a Q&A afterwards, and, um, and a, a couple sort of said, you know, I can't remember, the wife was Lutheran, the, the, the husband was um, Catholic, and the wife said, you know, my husband can come to communion with me, Eucharist with me, in my Lutheran church, why can't I go with him? And what Pope Francis said, and I can't remember the exact phrase, but it's something along the lines of, uh, I can't quite see what the problem is, but there are an awful lot of people who do think there's a problem, so I better not say very much about that. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, what, I, I mean, I'm with him. I don't understand what the problem is, because I looked at great length. I mean, obviously, you know, I spent my life trying to understand what transubstantiation means. And, um, and then I look at Luther's ideas about the real presence, and you really are hard-pressed to put a, 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 a piece of tissue paper between them. I, don't, I really don't understand what the difference is in, in, in that way. Someone's probably going to tell me now. Um, so I think uh, in terms of... Uh, I, I think we're probably beyond the time of reunion at the moment. It's sort of, it's sort of slipped off the table slightly. But in terms of uh, valuing each other's traditions and being very close, Catholics and Lutherans are as close as close can be. Well, sadly, I think we've, we've run out of time, and I'm sorry about that, because, Peter, you're a master of your material, <laughs> and uh, the, the, the infectious enthusiasm you have for your subject, I think, means that if we haven't read the book, we're, we're going to want to read it. But also, uh, thanks, for line, isn't it? thanks for taking <laughs> us back and letting us see the events that we're commemorating now through the eyes of the man who was at the heart of it. That's one of the most successful things about your book. So... Huge thanks again, please, to Peter Sanford. Thank you very much. Thank you.